Actually, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. So bear with me. <laughs> so I, I thought the purpose of the initial remarks was to give you a feeling for where I'm coming from and who I am. And that would put the discussion into better context. So I was born in India as in a group called the Eastern Orthodox Christians who claimed to have been descended from the disciples that, uh, of St. Thomas, Doubting Thomas. Now, that's not really clear, but history is not clear on that, but it's pretty clear that by, three, by the time of the Nicene uh, Synod, 325 AD, they were Christians there, and they got cut off from the rest of Christendom for uh, a thousand years till they were rediscovered later. So I started with that tradition, and then I ended up going to a high school, Bishop Carton Boys School, which is a British-style high school with an Anglican Christian uh, bent there. And so there I was uh, in the choir, in the chapel. I was a chapel prefect, if you know what that means. I was the, uh, um, uh, I won the scripture prize every year continuously. Uh, and uh, at the age of 13, I had what could be called a born-again experience. So, uh, so by the time I finished school, I thought I pretty much knew what I needed to know about these matters. But then I went to medical school. And medical school had also happened to be a Christian institution, Christian Medical College, Bellor, uh, which had a strong Christian ethos, but also taught medicine in the Western style based on science. So I was really exposed to practical aspects of science there. And there I ran into something that was very difficult to deal with, which is the question of why is it that a just and merciful and all-powerful God would allow a four-year-old child to have leukemia, right? So I, I had rediscovered a problem that has vexed theologians for a long time. It's called the problem of theodicy. Uh, you know, why, why does that happen, right, if God is so powerful? So, uh, in pursuing science further, I found my answer. And the answer really is the same one that the Catholic Church had independently come up with, apparently I found out later, from reading Francisco Ayala's work, and that is evolution. All of biology is the product of evolution, biological evolution, which has happened over three and a half billion years. And the only way evolution can work and generate the diversity we see on the planet today is by someone suffering. There's no way to have evolution without selection, natural selection, and you've heard of phrases like survival of the fittest and so on. So that kind of fi finally started making sense to me. Um, and that put me more and more in line with learning science as a way to approach things. Um, and eventually I ended up here uh, getting more and more into studies of human evolution because I wanted to know who I am, where did I come from. And science gives you a way to approach these questions that are not strictly based on faith but also based on evidence that you can collect. But in the meanwhile, I didn't give up my uh, background because um, I think you can say that uh, uh, regardless of what your beliefs are, that there's been no one like Jesus on this planet, right? So what's the explanation for that? Uh, so I decided that the way to go about that is also science, to try and understand the real story of Jesus, not just based on what a group of people, 325 AD, decided should be the final answer 300 years after his crucifixion, but rather based on all the evidence I could find. So I've spent a lot of my own time researching these questions. Who was Jesus? What happened? What really happened? What parts of the story are, have well documented? What parts are not? What is he doing between the age of 12 and 30? I, I don't think he was just a carpenter in Nazareth. Uh, what about the claims when I grew up in India that Jesus came to India? So there are all these parts that are not part of the standard canon, 
which I think are amenable to research and science. And so that's the way I've approached that question. And it still left me with the same answer that uh, if we could all live like Jesus, this would be a much better planet, right? So that hasn't changed. But meanwhile then, I decided that I needed to also pursue who am I? Where did I come from? And the answer to that comes from science and pursuit of understanding human origins. Now there, unlike the case with historical records of Jesus, we can get a lot more solid information and the evidence is now pouring in from all over. And there's some really fascinating things there about who we are. We are clearly, uh, you know, primates, common ancestors of the chimpanzees six million years ago. On the other hand, uh, the chimpanzees aren't having a Veritas forum. <laughs> and they're unlikely to do so. So what's that all about? And so it turns out when you look in human evolution, there are a couple of rather deep mysteries that uh, I think Josh and I might discuss later. Uh, one of them is that um, humans are a very peculiar singularity. I don't know if there's any ecologists in the audience, but during the question time, I'll challenge you to find me any other example in the history of this planet where a single subspecies that was part of many other lineages existing at the time, Neanderthals, Denisovans, all kinds of other lineages. We don't know how many there were actually, there were probably a couple of dozen, who were around, upright, controlling fire, doing pretty interesting things, and maybe a few of them starting to bury their dead. And then there's one group of individuals, uh, five to 10,000, uh, the, the genetics just don't work, I'm sorry, with a man and a woman, it has to be five to 10,000, and that's, that's what the data says come out of Africa, spread across the planet, and even though we interbreed with all these other species or subspecies, we just take over completely. There's hardly anything left of them. Each of you have little bits and pieces of DNA from them which you hear about all the time in the news, but there's hardly anything left of them. It's only us. So it's as if the grizzly bears of North America, uh, you know, many of the bears are cross-fertile across the world. It's as if the grizzly bears of North America came out and took over all the other bears in the planet and replaced all of them. There's nobody left except grizzly bears. That's what humans did. So uh, ecologists keep coming back to me with various examples. And it always turns out it's a temporary example in one corner of the world where some particular species was successful for a little while or something like that. The only other species I've found that comes anywhere near close are killer whales, orcas. Interesting, the only other species that have grandmothers uh, that have basically taken over the oceans, and there seem to be very few close relatives. Other than that, I can find nothing. So there's a real unusual feature of humans. And the other unusual feature, which we might talk about, because Josh found it interesting when I talked to him about it, is what I call Wallace's paradox, uh, which is basically something we can, we can discuss further, but the fact that uh, Humans are very, very unusual in our abilities, uh, and that these abilities were already present 70 to 100,000 years ago in Africa. Again, I can find no other example on the planet of a species that, in which uh, this degree of uh, acceptation, which would, which would be the, the correct uh, evolutionary term, has occurred at the cognitive level. So these are just some thoughts to begin with, so you'll know where I'm coming from, that uh, um, I'm still trying to find uh, the real story of Jesus. And I'm still trying to find the real story of myself. And both of those are really scientific pursuits. They don't have to be based just on faith and, and, uh, and uh, belief they can be approached scientifically. Let's find out. Once we know the real answers, we may never know the exact final answers, but the more we find out, the better off we all are, I think. And that's where I think science and religion can uh, come together. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name's uh, Dr. Josh Swamidas. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Varkey. 
I got to tell you a little bit about us. Um, I actually know Dr. Varkey. He's known me for about 30 years now. Um, I know what you're thinking. He can't be that old. <laughs> but actually, um, um, in India, my mom went to the same medical school that Dr. Varkey did. So they would have alumni meetings here in the United States. And I met him um, over potluck Indian food. <laughs> and I grew up in a very conservative Christian family. Um, where uh, evolution was not, um, I mean, was not accepted. It was interesting. I was also in this world that was like in touch with science, and um, and he's very modest. But you should know that Dr. Varkey is a phenomenal scientist. Isn't that true? Um, and I'm nodding to a couple of my colleagues here that are scientists too. He's he's he is a phenomenal scientist, and it was him and many of his friends, like Dr. George Shandy and others that were a big part of why I just recognize there's something really beautiful there in science. So you're one of my mentors in that regard. So I just want to thank you for that, too. Um, this is going to be an interesting conversation, too, because this is actually a conversation between friends. What I wanted to talk to you about uh, to lay things out is explain to you um, who I am and specifically talk about um, how I, as a Christian, have really found, surprisingly to me, how there's massive amounts of common ground between um, what I found it means to follow Jesus and so many of the scientific colleagues I have. Um, I'm a scientist and a Christian, and, and the way how this is really divided up is, is I'm going to talk for just really briefly about what I think it means to be a scientist and what it means to be a Christian. Um, and I think that's going to kind of lay a good foundation for the rest of the conversation here. And then specifically also about what I see as some opportunities for unexpected common ground. So um, this is a slide. This is the one slide I have in my research. Um, these are all drug molecules. And they all have a furan ring. A furan ring is like that right there. It's like a five-membered ring with an oxygen. That um, structure can actually become toxic if your liver adds, uh, adds a, a epoxide to it, an oxygen group to it. So one of the things our group does is actually build software that can identify patterns and lots of data to predict when furan rings become toxic and when they're not. So if you can see here, um, what we've done is that we've actually taken these drug molecules that have furans. They're all the furans are circled in red. And then we've also overlaid on it with color a prediction from the computer software our group bit, built to predict which, where epoxidations happen in these molecules. And there's this really cool thing that happens that uh, these two molecules, you can see a really high value. That's because they actually are epoxidized and they become toxic. And the rest of them have low values because they aren't epoxidized. And the really cool thing is, is that those are the only two of these drugs that actually become toxic by this mechanism. So it turns out that there's real clear patterns that you can actually discover um, by looking at lots of data that can then be really useful in developing drugs. So that's what our group does. In a lot of ways, um, this is really instructive about what science is, is. Now, if you're a scientist at heart, you're probably like super engaged by this. <laughs> but if you're not a scientist, you might be wondering, this is kind of boring. I hope the rest of the talk isn't like this. <laughs> Most of science is really engaged in these very mundane questions that get scientists really excited and virtually no one else. <laughs> and that's okay, because I just find these things to be really exciting. I also point out that I'm hiring, so if you're interested. <laughs> I just got my first NIH grant, so that kind of gets to another thing. Like, science is really done in community. <laughs> it's something that isn't, it's not just an abstract idea. This is actually a community of people that I've really come to find my home in. You could also look at my website there if you're more curious about what I do. I'll also point out, too, one thing, because this is going to come up in a moment. There's never any point in this scientific work that I sit back and wonder, well, that drug was metabolized in this way. I wonder if God specifically reached into my experiment and did it. Okay? Now, I'm not saying God never could do that. It's just that's never a scientific question, because that's, that's violating one of the core fundamentals of science, which is something called methodological naturalism. And I'm, I'm just not, that's not the purpose of science. I'm not trying to understand how God intervenes in our livers. I want to know how livers act with drugs on their own. And so that's, that's kind of like a key starting point for what science is. And of course, that's not controversial at all when I'm talking about the metabolism of drugs. But as soon as we extend this to other places, that starts to become controversial. And we're going to get to that in a moment in terms of how we can think about common ground in that context. Does that make sense? All right. So why am I a Christian, and what does it mean to be a Christian? And there's two stories I want to tell you about two different books. The first one is about More Than a Carpenter. If you're, as I tell you the story, if, if you're interested in getting this, there's actually going to be a way to get this for yourself if you're interested. But for me, um, 
I uh, grew up in a Christian family, and at a certain point, um, especially as I was getting more and more exposed to science and evidence and reason, I just decided the fact that my parents were Christian was not enough of a good reason for me to be, fall- be a Christian. That was not a good enough a reason to follow Jesus. And so I really wanted to know what is the core of Christianity, and why should I believe it, and what is the evidence behind it? And um, it's a long process. I'm happy to answer more during my questions. But I uh, joined the question and answers, but I really ended up with this book in my hands, More Than a Carpenter, by Josh McDowell. And I read it, and it clearly explained, I think, a truth that you can see throughout um, every true Christian thinker. But the core of our faith is not anti-evolutionism, it's not republicanism, it's not Americanism. The core of our faith is not the endorsement of any particular denomination or any particular belief system, per se. It's rather, um, it's rather this person in history, this person in this physical world that we all inhabit, 2,000 years ago, Jesus. And what happened 2,000 years ago, of this claim in our faith that God revealed himself to all of humanity through this person and proved it by letting him die and then rising him from the dead. And that's not a metaphor. That's a physical statement. It's something in the physical world that we all inhabit it's not exactly science, because the claim is that there's no physical me- mechanism for this. This is God's act in history to make himself known. Um, and this book correctly puts the emphasis of, emphasis of Christianity on that, and really clearly explains the clear, hard evidence for that. That really transformed me, because I realized even though that the churches I was around didn't make sense to me, even though um, I, met, I came across a lot of Christians that were very difficult to deal with, even though a lot of stuff didn't make sense to me, that if the resurrection really happened, that's good enough reason to put up with all of that. <laughs> now, I tell you that story um, not because that's sufficient, because really what you need to do, I mean, there's actually mountains of evidence that you need to go into. You could spend a lifetime waiting in this. I think one of the things that science has really made me question the most about faith, and, and the reason why, honestly, I'm not really compelled by most other religions, except for, except for Christianity, is most religions really feel man-made. Um, they, they just feel very man-made. There's something that just feels thoroughly human about them. Um, what I encountered in Christianity through the resurrection is the only plausible case where, where there seems to be strong historical evidence that God himself reached out to us to make himself known. That evidence is strong. I'm not going to get into it now. I, I would just say, you know, if, if you're going to reject Jesus, don't do it because there isn't evidence unless you're willing to look into that evidence. And it'll take you a lot of time because there's a lot of it. All right, so that's why I'm a Christian. Um, I want to talk to you about some opportunities for common ground. I say opportunities because not everyone, I mean, a lot of Christians are fighting with scientists. Um, I think this is a little bit absurd because we have so much common ground with the science. Um, And so uh, there's a lot I could talk about. I'm going to give you four really quick things. Um, There's also a little link up there. It's like a tiny link. Um, If you want to write that down and look it up later, it's the stuff I've written down to kind of get more in in detail and in depth about this. It's going to be in the next couple slides, so don't panic. (laughs) You can listen to me too. The first one I would say is there's a lot of common ground between my faith as a Christian and um, science's history and its heroes. I'll give you a couple examples here, though there's a lot more. This is by no means exhaustive. Uh, Blaise Pascal... I'm sorry, Francis Bacon isn't even here. Like the founder of modern science is uh, is Francis Bacon. He's a Christian. He explains modern science in profoundly Christian terms with Christian theology explaining all these things, including methodological naturalism. This first first, uh, person here is Blaise Pascal. Um, He was in the 1960s. He uh, was a well... um, He he was a foundational scientist, but also uh, strongly believed in the resurrection. Actually, I would probably most... um, identify with him as, like, that's the type of Christian I am. <laughs> and he's just, like, French guy from, you know, 400 years ago. But the way he talks about science and his faith, I'm like, oh, he really got it in a way that I wish, you know, I wish I'd known earlier. Uh, Robert Boyle is another person like this, too. Boyle's all, he's one of the most um, important scientists in the 60s, 1600s as well. Uh, Christian, he, he was really instrumental in establishing this rule of methodological naturalism that you don't actually consider God. Science isn't to understand anything about God. It's actually quite bad at that. The purpose of science is to understand how natural things behave. Uh, also pointing around Ramon Cajal. There's a lot of neuroscientists here, right? At UCSB? Some or no? 
Yeah, so he's the guy who founded the field of neuroscience. Um, he was raised Catholic, he became an atheist, and then he came back to faith he, uh, when he, before he got his Nobel Prize uh, for discovering how neurons work. Uh, uh, he wrote, he, if you're a scientist, I should really encourage his book. It's called the Notes, Notes to a Young Investigator, or to young, Advice to a Young Scientist, I'm sorry. It's something like that, close to that. <laughs> um, where he really kind of maps out like the character it takes to really be a person who seeks truth in science. And, and I just found so much concordance between what he talks about being a, a truth seeker in science and what it means to be a truth seeker in, in faith. The last person I want to point here, he's not from history um, because he's still alive. This is the head of the NIH. Um, it's Francis Collins. This is who we all go to to get grants from. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's not his money, it's our money, it's tax money, but he, you know, whatever. He, uh, he wrote a book, which I think is really important. Um, it's called The Language of God, where he explains why he became a Christian. Now, he's a Christian who is really comfortable with the notion of evolution as, as the way how God created us. And some Christians are a little bit, like, you know, weirded out by that. Um, but I think what's, what's really critical and important about him is that uh, um, he's deeply respected in the scientific community. He is one of us. He is a scientist. And he correctly explains that the reason why he is a Christian is not because evolution is you know, questionable or wrong, but the reason why he's a Christian is because he encountered Jesus through the resurrection and came into a personal relationship with him. I really identify with that as well. I mean, if you look at science's history, you see that it's not really filled with Dawkins. It's really filled with a lot more people like Francis Collins. All right, so here's another common ground which I did not expect to find. So uh, this is a quote from Pascal, and this is a quote from a very well-known atheist, Eugenie Scott, who is really instrumental in arguing against uh, intelligent design in the Dover trial in 2005. So this is kind of like really controversial stuff, so sorry. I hope you don't hate me at the end of this. But they say things that are actually quite similar here. So Blaise Pascal wrote in uh, 1660, right before he died, and um, this, all those who claim to know God and prove him without Jesus have only weak proofs. And I would just say I completely agree with that. I think a lot of Christians are really devoted to uh, proving that God exists using science. I, I would just say I've never seen a strong proof in science for God. And I'm not really surprised by that, because as a Christian, I believe that it's only through the death and resurrection of Jesus that I have confidence that God exists and that he's good and he wants to be known. And it's not through human effort to study nature that I come to believe that God exists. And, and you know, that's why he's saying if their proof of God doesn't involve Jesus Christ, it's a weak proof. Uh, Eugenie Scott is an atheist, or she likes to call herself a non-theist, but atheist is, I think, on how most people would understand it. Though I don't want to offend her. She calls herself a non-theist. Um, she says, properly understood the principle of methodological naturalism, this notion that we don't consider God when we do a science, requires neutrality towards God. We cannot say wearing our scientist's hat whether God does or does not exist. This is a key thing. Science never actually ever considers the hypothesis of God, so it can't ever properly claim to prove that God doesn't exist or that he does exist. That's just not the purpose of science. When science was invented 400 years ago, what modern science, they already believed in creation. That's not what the purpose of science was. It was more to understand how creation worked. So it's a little bit of an anachronism to kind of say, well, we're going to try and use science to prove God. So I find a lot of common ground with my atheist colleagues about this, the fact that science neither proves that God exists or doesn't. I would also say there's common ground in resurrection. Not that most scientists believe in the resurrection, but because science can't really interrogate when God is acting and when doesn't, and because the central claim of the resurrection is that God acted, um, it's illogical to say that science can really answer or even consider the question of the resurrection. In science's world, um, death is never reversible. When you die, you're dead. That's it. There's no way to reverse that. And that's completely correct, unless God exists. And that's why God, I believe, chose to use death as a place to make himself known to our entire world. Once again, I'm emphasizing this comment by Eugenie Scott, because of methodological naturalism, science is essentially useless to address the resurrection. This doesn't mean that there isn't evidence that's reasonable you can reason with about the, the resurrection. It just means that you have to kind of step out from the natural rules of science to really address it. All right, so this is the last point I want to make um, about human exceptionalism. So this is, once again, I would say an opportunity for common ground. And one of the reasons why I really like talking to Dr. Barkey, Dr. Barkey um, is a, a leader in human evolution. 
And he shares my disdain for how scientists add the ideology into um, how they describe evolution to claim that we're just human. I'm sorry, we're, humans are just animals. If that was true, I would have a great deal of concern. The reason why it's concerning is that means there'd be no ethically higher value on a human life over that human's pet's life. Um, there'd be no reason to think that, um, you know, we should be more concerned about this toddler, this human toddler, to be clear, <laughs> over this orangutan. <laughs> and I agree that we are animals, but I also think that we're more than animals. I mean, I know that, um, I mean, actually, I think that everyone here knows that. <laughs> we just don't always have the best way to explain it. I mean, I, I, the way I would explain it as a Christian, I think that somehow, in a mystical way, God adds his image to us. But, um, but it's also something that leaves a signature in, how, in what science sees about humans. And I think that's one of the things I'm actually looking forward to kind of talking about with Dr. Varkey in our discussion time. So with that, that's the main thing I want to share with you. I went a little bit long, so sorry about that. But from here, um, should I, what do we do now? I just wanted to cover one point I forgot to make. Sure, and that is it. that, uh, as you know, I just agreed to pinch hit for this session. I wasn't the original speaker, but I'm glad I did it. But then I found that the advertisements appeared to say that I was an evolutionist. An unusual term I'd never really looked at before. So I looked up in Google, <laughs> and... <laughs> It says that I'm somebody that believes in evolution. No, I don't believe in evolution. I know evolution occurred. Belief is a matter of when you're not sure about something and you have faith in something. So I think the evidence for biological evolution is no worse than that the earth goes around the sun instead of the sun going around the earth or the earth being round and not flat. So that I think we should just set aside. Now, if you want to say, how did evolution begin? Did God intervene in evolution? Was God involved in setting up evolution? Uh, how did evolution generate humans? Was God involved in that, as Francis Collins and others would suggest? I have no problem with those discussions. I just have a problem with starting out from a point where we don't accept plain, simple, scientific reality. That uh, know. So I think your starting point is belief and evolution, which, which I'm comfortable with. I mean, use, I, the word, I, use the word belief again. <laughs> well, I, okay, okay, okay. We'll use your terms when you talk about you, but right. I just want to clarify a couple of things. When I sure. use faith, so I think you're using faith in a way totally different than me. You're saying faith is unsubstantiated belief in well, things in, that may in, or may in, not be in, facts. Incompletely substantiated belief. Yeah, so yeah. that is not how I use faith. Okay. Well, I mean, so I understand you can use it that way, but when I say the word yeah. faith, I think it's much more um, understood as trust. So trust can be substantiated. In fact, it's best when it's substantiated. So that's what I mean by faith. Now, I understand that's different than our culture's understanding, but that's, that's, that's what I mean when I say faith. Uh, and I think it's actually important because, um, um, yeah. And, and I also think that you can have a fact that is true independent mm -hmm. of whether or not you agree with it or not. And so I think you can talk about something that's true that you believe. Um, mm -hmm. So... I, I, I think what you're trying to convince, it, it conveys is that you think that there's no debate about whether or not evolution happened. And yeah, I think I actually, on a long uh, uh, car ride, I listened to Francis Collins reading his own book. It was really, really very powerful. And he comes out at the end and says, yeah, I mean, the evidence is so overwhelming that it's foolish to, to get into that business. Let's instead ask the question, who is God? Where is God? What does God do? Let's focus on that. It's, it's, I, I personally don't understand 
why this has become such an issue. And the only reason I can think of is because of literal interpretations, you know, of, of no, I, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, I think that, for example, it's not uncommon for scientists to inject ideolog ideology alongside the science. Mm -hmm. So I'll point out a couple of really poor ambassadors for science. Like one of them is Dawkins. I think he's done more to inhibit understanding of science than probably anyone else. Because uh, he's actually promoting atheism and trying to say that atheism is the same thing as science. But he's, a, he's, he's an evangelical atheist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, you know you're, you're a very informed person. I'm an informed person. But if you're only, I mean, we know lots of scientists. We know that most scientists aren't like Dawkins. But um, out, out in you know, the public dialogue, a lot of people don't know that. They think most scientists are like, are, are like Dawkins. And they think most scientists are evangelical atheists. And that evolution is just a club that they're using to argue against God. Now, I, I think I have come to know that that's not true because I am in science. Um, so th that's like one piece of it. I think another place where it comes in too is where people kind of add um, this. I mean, so it's true that if you look at us, we're, that we have a lot of features that are consistent with, you know, I mean, we're mammals, right? <laughs> There's a reason why we have hair. There's a reason why we have hearts. There's a reason why we have brains that look really similar to, to animals. Um, but, and, and I agree with that, but I think it's also very dangerous to say that we're just that. And a lot of scientists go the extra mile of philosophically making that claim, which is a little bit too much. And I think you have a problem with that too, don't you? Yeah, I think it, this week's New York Times the uh, front page of the Sunday Review is Franz Duval talking about anthropomorphism and anthropodenial, as he calls it. And he takes that position, a strong position, against human exceptionalism. In other words, the idea is that human exceptionalism, we've gone from the times of Aristotle and the Victorian idea of humans as being at the top of the, py of the pyramid of creation and the scale of nature, all the way to saying we're just another ape. The real story is somewhere in between. Uh, and I think that's what we should search for. And I think it's a mistake to take these poles apart views. By the way, I mean, I, I think that people like Dawkins also serve a function because y you need, just as you have extreme evangelical uh, Christians or believers who take extreme views that don't fit with practical reality, you need both extremes. So I think <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to his points, points of view that way. I just think that we we'll call me crazy, think, but I'm no, more I, I excited think, about this conversation. No, I think it does. It doesn't <laughs> help this conversation, yeah. which is what we need. So, yeah, I think there's something. As I said, I gave you the the ec ecological reason why I think humans are new, very, very, very unusual. Uh, in that there was something about us when we came out of Africa that allowed us to basically take over the planet. Actually, Swante Pabo is a very famous uh, ancient DNA person. He and I were having a discussion the other day about this problem of human exceptionalism and why it's such a problem. We hit on a solution to make human exceptionalism acceptable to everybody. <laughs> Humans are the worst, most disastrous, invasive species on the planet. <laughs> True. <laughs> Everywhere we go, we destroy species, environment, ecology, everything. There's no exception. There has been no species like us that has ever been so successful in destroying everything. <laughs> so if you prefer that as an uh, way of looking at human ex well, I think we need to explain that. Well, I, I would say we're probably, we should probably also be not just more than animals. We should be more than cancer, too, right? <laughs> no, no. I, I'm just saying that this, what I just said, is also true. But uh, that, that equally requires an sure. explanation. Why, well, why didn't they, so, you know. I've well, I, I, think, I think humans have an exceptional ability for evil and mm -hmm. for good. Right. I, th I think it's really both. I think in the same way that, um, you know, chimpanzees aren't doing a Veritas form, there's mm -hmm. no Mother Teresa chimpanzee. Right. There's also no Hitler chimpanzee. Right. <laughs> no, that's very true. And so it really comes down to what happened in Africa 70 to 100,000 years ago, give or take. And as you know, I've written a book about this based on an idea that a person gave me before he died. And I'm not sure I found necessarily the right answer, but the thing that Danny Brower said is that you shouldn't be asking what made us human. You should be asking what stopped elephants, dolphins, crows, chimpanzees, whales, 
there have been incredibly smart creatures across this planet for 100 million years. So how come we aren't competing with a human-like elephant or a human-like dolphin? So the only answer to that you can give is some kind of singularity. And I have suggested it's a psychological evolutionary barrier that none of the others could cross. And we cross, and it has to do, that's not, not for tonight's discussion, it's about, if you want to read the book, it's about how we learn to understand our mortality and deal with it. The book is the called Denial. Denial, it's Denial. Yeah. It's because it's about how... So uh, that's just one possible explanation. So I, I think that what happened there is really critical to try and figure out. And it can be done because we now have genomes of Neanderthals and Denisovans and the, all the other creatures that were around at the time that lost. And they are 99.98% similar to us. Uh, not that close, no, but 99 plus percent similar to us, 99.5, 99.6. So right there, if God left a mark, it's right there. Mm -hmm. You can find it, so it's worth looking for. So the other thing I mentioned, which you wanted me to talk about, is Wallace's paradox. I'm sure all of you know about Charles Darwin. How many of you have heard of Alfred Russell Wallace? Just a few hands go up. Alfred Russell Wallace was the co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection. Absolutely independent. He was having a malarial fit in a, sitting in a hut in, uh, in Indonesia and came up with this idea. And he wrote to his, men, not his mentor, his hero, Darwin, and said, Respected sir, what do you think of my idea? And Darwin did the right thing, and they published together. So they should have had equal credit. So why does nobody talk about Wallace? Uh, one reason is that he got into some other unusual ideas that didn't turn out scientifically correct and all that, but those are minor issues. The major issue is that, I, I think, when I go back and read Wallace's, Wallace said, I can explain everything by natural selection except the human mind. And Darwin is said to have written to him saying, you are tearing down the edifice we built together. So I went back and I, I call it Wallace's conundrum. Some people call it Wallace's paradox. Here's what it is. If you do a thought experiment and take a thousand newborn babies from that time, soon after that time in Africa, 70,000 years ago when we emerged, right? Take a thousand newborn babies, bring them to California today, and give them every opportunity. And you come back 50 years later, you won't be able to find them. They'll be just part of us, They're just like us. Actually, the experiment's been done. It's called the University of California. <laughs> so, people who left Africa 70,000 years ago and spread across the planet have returned to various places and had babies from their background. Uh, they're all very similar genetically, but there's a lot of variation. So that means that 70,000 years ago, Wallace said, all of the mental abilities to do calculus and astrophysics and symphonic music and philosophy and theology and Veritas forums <laughs> was already there. So he said, how can evolution, uh, you know, do that? And of course, immediately evolution says, come on, that's just an acceptation. You know, dinosaurs have feathers and birds can fly. Birds are using the feathers that dinosaurs have. It doesn't mean if I bring a dinosaur here, it's going to fly. So that is, I can think of, I've not come across an evolution any example of, so we are using our minds, 99.9999% of what you did today did not exist when your genes were evolved to become human. So that is unusual. And there are explanations of that based on our long childhood and our feedback learning and so on. But anyway, so you have these two unusual things about humans, the Wallace's paradox and the other is this, this unusual takeover and replacement, both of which I think are singularities. Uh, not the hey, tell them about the experiment you do with your daughter in the dictionary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's not I, exactly I, like a well-designed experiment. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. <laughs> so, so I run into this often. People say, come on. Yeah. And if, if you read Franz Duval the Sunday, he says chimpanzees laugh, they can be tickled, they can show remorse, they can, you know, it goes on and on about it. It's true. They should be very similar to us, right? We had a common ancestor with them, so I'm not surprised. But they say, then he says, well, there's nothing special about humans. So my exercise that I told them about dinner last night was many years ago, my daughter was young, we were flying across the Atlantic, 
of the Pacific and a long plane ride with nothing to do, and I think she was eight or nine or something, I had a dictionary. I said, take a dictionary and start from A and stop when you find the first thing that's uniquely human. And within 45 minutes, with a little help from me, she had gone to Z. So I said, okay, uh, take the letter S and start. And we started with, uh, you know, everything from skating to spelunking to surfing to swimming to on and on. We gave up. We filled the page and stopped at one point. So the point is that we humans do a lot of things that no other animals do. Of course, the immediate response is, that's not fair. Um, that's a human dictionary. <laughs> All right? Fair enough. So my answer to that is, okay, make a chimpanzee dictionary. Uh, the chimpanzees can't do it, so you'll have to do it. <laughs> but make a chimpanzee dictionary, write down all the things that chimpanzees have ever been known to do. And it'll be 1% the thickness of the human dictionary. So it's the same thing. So I, th I think, unfortunately, there's, be careful. Go out there and say the word human exceptionalism and people jump all over you. And the simple idea behind that, which I happen to agree with, is that if we take ourselves to be unique and superior, we will treat everything else badly, which we shouldn't. Yeah, so um, I guess my response as a Christian is this, uh, to this idea of, like, are we animals or are we more than animals? I would say um, there's actually a real deep tradition in theology of paradox, of both things being equally true. So I think it's, we are actually fully animals, yeah. but we're also fully spiritual. We're also something fully that's something that transcends the animal. Um, we're, we're both of those things. So I don't actually think that we're kind of halfway between the two. I think we're kind of both. Um, but that, that's kind of my take. Yeah, on. no, I, if I had brought my slides, I would have put up a slide which I always put up saying, humans are remarkably similar, chimpanzees are remarkably similar to humans, which is true. I can give many examples. Second slide, Chimp uh, humans are remarkably different from chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. More information. Both are true. Yeah, so, I mean, so I think this is actually really an interesting conversation because you're not just a random person. You're a well-respected scientist. You are a leading expert in human evolution. And I think the way you talk about this is the way that I think a lot of even very conservative Christians would feel comfortable with. Um, and I think that's actually really helpful. I think this is an example that have a common ground I'm talking about. Because it's sometimes, um, I think one of the challenges that I think I at least experienced um, as being a religious person in the scientific world is when people try and conflate their own ideologies with science and kind of present that as science mixed in together. Um, I don't know, I think science is a little bit grander than, than that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And going back to, to Jesus, I think that there I have a bit of a problem in that I don't know. I don't know what I need to know. And I think there's a lot of missing pieces. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that's also a subject that should should not be just taken at faith. It should be researched to sure. find so, out. So I had a question about that yeah. for you. So yeah. um, and please don't take this sure, as disrespectful. Sure. Um, but what do you think about the resurrection? I'm not really sure. I used to believe in it. I'm not really sure because, uh, you know, there is right now in what is Taliban territory, so nobody can go there, there are two graves. One is of a holy man who came from the Far East and his mother named Mary next to each other. Um, the crucifixion that the Romans did was six days. Um, there is this problem of what Jesus was doing from the age of 12 to 30. So in my view, there's a lot of missing pieces. But none of it takes away from the fact, as I said earlier, which I think that's what we need to focus on, that if you could all be like Jesus, this world would be a much better place to begin with. Yes, yeah, so I understand where you're coming from, but I yeah. guess for me, so there's a lot that I actually really yeah. admire about where you're coming from this, in the sense that you're not just willing to just take the easy path. You really yeah. want to know, if, you want to know the truth. Yeah. Um, and you're also willing to not be all or none about things. Right. And yeah, I'd say I, I'm agnostic about those issues. Right I, I respect that about you a lot, um, and I, I, I really do. 
I guess one thing for me, though, is if Jesus didn't really die and rise again, I don't see what's different about him and Buddha. I mean, Buddha was a nice guy. I, I, Gandhi was a great guy. Uh, no, I don't think so. If you read about those people. <laughs> no. Well, how about, can you tell us, um, no, leaving no. the res resurrection for a side, right. what do you find is like so uniquely compelling about Jesus' life? I can't think of a single thing Jesus did that would be bad to do. He, he was even against bureaucracy. <laughs> he went into the temple and threw down all the... So, whereas, you look at all the others and say, okay, if everybody, uh, please don't, I'm, I don't mean to insult any Buddhists, and I think Buddhism is a wonderful, it's not really a religion, it's a way of life as I understand it, but if everybody went and sat in a forest and tried to attain nirvana, that would be good for that individual, but society would fall apart. If everybody did what Gandhi did, and it, you know, you'd achieve a lot of things. If everybody did what Mother Teresa did, uh, you'd achieve a lot of things, but it wouldn't work. Uh, so, and almost every other religious leader, originator that I've read about, was deeply flawed in some way or the other. And, you know, when you look, not flawed in the sense of, uh, as, as a model, right? So uh, that's, that's what I'm, so, but you know, it comes down to when you talk about singularities, uh, Betsy and I were saying this last night, there has to have been one person on this planet who said there was the greatest human that ever lived. How, how, how does that have to be? I don't understand. Because if you have, so if you have so, so, such a large pe case of time, in, any, in, in any, any pile of information, you're always going to find the one that's at the top. They always will be. Oh, able. I see you're saying, okay. It's There's something who's the best, right? They, the they best always is the best. Okay. And so... It's a tautology in a lot so of You're right. So it doesn't necessarily... It, it suggests something. And the same thing with the human species, the things we've been talking about, the strange and unusual features of humans, you know, with which I can find no, no comparator, although a lot of the human evolutionists would argue with me on that. Um, so it still doesn't mean that... So if I follow the logic that Francis Collins put forward, he goes to that point and says, okay, something must have intervened, or suggests that something intervened. Well, so I, I guess I have another question about the resurrection. Sure. You, you say you're, you're an agnostic about it. Mm -hmm. I found this a little bit remarkable, actually, in the sense that it seems like you're actually open to that is a place where God could have done it, even though you're not certain. Yeah, I mean, if, if God wanted to do it, it could have been done, but I don't have any any scientific proof. Uh, there are circumstances that suggest that that's what happened. The, the real problem I have is that the first things that were written down, as you know, were th actually the first things written down were by, by Paul the Apostle, who, uh, not the Apostle, Paul, St. Paul, who never met Jesus, the first writings. Then came, the, then came the many, many, many Gospels. And finally, a subset, after 300 years of, of argument, Constantine said, that's it, no more of this. And a non-Christian, Constantine, who converted, decided that it was time to stop this. And so we have what is modern-day Christianity, and that's, by the way, the, the church in Antioch that, uh, that you know, was connected to South India also was part of that senate. The Nicene and the Nicene Creed was created. It's but kind of funny how that happens, and they forget that Indians exist out there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's it seems like a little bit like metaphorical. Right. Like, right. Uh, but <laughs> that's 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 three hundred years, uh, and there are other. You know, I, I I also read the other gospels that got discarded. They claim to be heresies because they they had to say they were heresies to get rid of them. But there are many other gospels to read, and they tell you. The, but the general story is the same. That's the other interesting thing. Oh, the other thing is that I think that, that in the process, women got marginalized and set aside uh, in, the, in Christianity, uh, which is now being corrected gradually. Well, I would, you know, I'd be honestly just, yeah. um, I mean, I hesitate to say friend because you're my elder. And, right. You know, <laughs> right. But uh, as a fellow scientist and a person who's a family friend, um, mm -hmm. I, I'd be very curious to see what we think about N.T. Wright's book, because he gets into all of these details. Mm -hmm. And if you read about it, a person who's, I mean, I think one thing that I've learned in science is that expertise is really valuable. Right. 
I mean, this stuff is so complicated that, I mean, if I wanted to know about glycobiology, mm. you would be the, one of the first people I would call because mm. I'm sure you have greater insight than I would get right. into it from any, um, any textbook. I mean, N.T. Wright's a guy who's devoted his entire life to studying these questions. I'm really curious mm -hmm. how you would read his expertise. Mm -hmm. Sure, no, I'm, I'm open to, to on, the, on the other end, I would say to you, uh, uh, get hold of a DVD called Jesus in India, okay. which tells the story of a Southern Baptist Christian who asked this question, how could there have been this incredible child in the temple at the age of 12 who disappears for 18 years, couldn't have just been a carpenter? And there are bits and pieces of little evidence that well, maybe Jesus we'll may have gone down the Silk Road to India and absorbed all the great religions of the world. So at the end of that DVD, the, he goes back to, uh, by the way, the, all the organized Christianity refused to accept any of this. They said, none of this. He was a carpenter, right? So he goes back to them and says, goes back to the Indian guy and says, how come they don't look at all this evidence? I said, are you kidding? If you said that, you'd have to say that Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, all the religions are one great religion. I don't have a problem with that. If Jesus synthesized all of that, I think that's fantastic. Well, I would say um, we should do a book exchange <laughs> <laughs> and come back next year <laughs> and, and see what we learn. Anyways, that's actually probably a good point for yeah. us. Yeah, I was thinking this is a good time for starting some questions. I have uh, three here to begin with. Um, actually, I can't see you two if I stand behind there, so okay. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Um, so, anybody with questions, please text them to the number up here. Um, there's three oh, there's to also, start with. There's also uh, microphones. Oh, yeah, and there's micro microphones in the back. But I, I actually would prefer if you texted them, if that's all right with you. All right, um, so I'm not sure. This probably could be for both of you. And the question is, what evidence is there for the resurrection? Maybe you want to start with this, Josh. If it cannot be proved through science, how can it be trusted or accepted as true? Yeah, so I think we have to kind of start first, first start with why, what science is and why we don't expect the resurrection to be proven with science. Science is not just reasoning from evidence. It's also using a whole set of rules. That, I mean, people have been studying nature and using evidence and reason since the beginning of humanity. But modern science started 400 years ago with a specific set of rules. One of those rules is that when we do science, we do science to understand how natural things behave with other natural things. You never actually consider God as a direct cause of things. So that's why science can't ever really engage even the hypothesis of the resurrection, because it starts with the claim of something that's entirely outside of science. So you reject it right from the start, independent of the evidence. It's like circular reasoning. So that's the first thing about why science doesn't really help you with the resurrection. Though I will point out there is a couple of parts where it does become relevant. It's, be, it's because of science and things like radio dating, we can actually figure out what the dates of particular manuscripts are mm -hmm. and kind of figure out archaeological things. But that doesn't really resolve the core of the question of did this person actually rise from the dead. All right. So um, this gets the next pitch, part, of the, the part of the problem of uh, why would you believe anything that you couldn't prove that way? Well, I think the fact of the matter is that we believe things that we can't prove scientifically all the time, and we really have to to function in this world. Um, if you've ever been in a relationship with someone that you think loves you and you think love them, you did not prove that they love you scientifically. <laughs> That's just not how it works. Like, if, you went, if I went to my wife and saying, you know, I need to do, come up with a couple experiments with you right now <laughs> to find out if you really love me, that wouldn't work terribly well. And in fact, that's just not how it happens. I mean, maybe we can, you could construct some sort of contrived circumstance, but that's exactly what it is. It's contrived. That is not how the world turns. Um, that is such a foundationally important thing that just science doesn't really help you. Now, you can start understanding patterns of love across lots of people. When it comes to the particular of the person you're in a relationship with, science doesn't help you. So um, from that, I would say that science is limited, and we certainly cannot only trust science alone. Um, now, some people take that to mean then, well, anything I say about the resurrection is not based on evidence and it's not reasonable. That's not what I said. I think it's totally based on evidence and it's reasonable. Um, Ajit Varki was actually talking about some of this evidence. Um, 
I'll say that um, a lot of what I heard from churches about that evidence was a bit of a character in a cartoon. Um, and so, uh, for example, if you look at uh, biblical manuscripts, you will see differences between them. Mm -hmm. And I was taught that there was no differences. Um, that is a distinction that, um, that is important because um, I would say the differences are very small. <laughs> But it's not that there is no differences. And this is something where you actually have to get into the details if you really care about that stuff to look into it. Um, there's several things about the story that, um, that just don't make sense with anything we know about ancient first century Palestine. It's not a natural extension of first century Palestine or Jewish thought that you would jump from a person dying. People thought uh, people would rise again eventually someday in some spiritual world. But no one said, you know, they, you can believe that, but don't believe, don't actually claim that Jesus rose again three days later, and that you saw him again, that's craziness. Um, that, that, I mean, everyone for all of time has known that, that in this world, death is irreversible. I mean, science, in, in science we know that too, but that's not like science discovered that. People have known that forever. And they weren't claiming that someone in the very distant past had risen from the dead. They were claiming someone who people were alive at that time had met and that he died and rose again. And the people who were closest to that were willing to lay down their, their faith, uh, uh, lay down their lives in, in because of that experience that they were claiming. And like how you would say, they, they were taking it, it seems, as if it was a fact. Not like a hypothetical belief. And, and I just have a hard time um, imagining that many people being that, um, that personally self-deluded in the same way. I, I have a hard time with that. Now, I do understand there's a lot of people who die for their religion, but um, the way how these people died is important. They died um, not uh, to go attack their enemies in some grand war. They died, um, they died as uh, minorities, without power, usually being offered the ability to walk entirely free if they were willing to renounce the resurrection. And yet, um, in the face of that, they were unwilling to renounce the resurrection and chose to lay down their lives willingly for that. And that, that's a testimony that, that speaks to me today. There, there's a lot more here. Um, I really do think that um, there's two books I would point to. One is, if, if you're a college student, I think a really accessible book is More Than a Carpenter. If you really care to get into like the academic depth of it, I really do recommend uh, N.T. Wright's book, uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God. No, I, I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, you have a person and an incident which transformed history, right? I mean, our calendar is based on it. it. The entire world history is based on that one person and that one event. And you're right that a lot of people that lived at the time, even though it was 30 years later, you read all these other extra gospels and all these other things, and there is a consistent story. And you're also right that uh, it wasn't the standard theology of the time. The Messiah was supposed to be some who came out with with sword and fire and kill the Romans. So it was not something that everybody was expecting. So from those points of view, I think something unusual happened, very unusual. But I'm not yet convinced that, I, I, I just would like to look into the evidence further. And you know, historians are still pulling out little bits and pieces of mm -hmm. information from here and there. So and so it's not for nothing that I'm from the lineage of Doubting Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next two questions have to do with your points of view on evolution. So, Professor Varkey, this one is, I think, kind of for you. Um, how can the average non-scientist make their own decision with regard to evolutionary evidence that you say is indisputable? So uh, what I would say is that you have two choices. One is you go and read about it and look in the facts. Or you say that, let me, let me go back to my suggestion that the earth goes around the sun and the sun doesn't go around the earth. And no, none of us, or very few people on the planet, have gone up there and seen that happening, right, from the space station or something like that. Yet we all believe it, based on a bunch of facts that many people have put together that and that aggregate. So it's like climate change. When you have an aggregate of information that points in one direction, you tend to believe it. On the other hand, if you want to get the real proof, I would say, as we were talking earlier, look at the extreme similarities between humans and chimpanzees on the one extreme, 
The other extreme, look at the fact that the DNA code of life, all life on the planet, by the DNA code, there's a beautiful picture in the back of Scientific American a couple of months ago. It comes down to one point for three and a half billion years. And the, there's, there's no exceptions. Whenever there's an exception, it turns out it, it's disproven. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the genetic code is, to me, the ultimate proof. And then the human-chimpanzee comparison, if you want to do the human comparison. So, I, I would say what makes it hard for... I mean, so, actually, the main reason why people reject evolution is um, religious belief. You, there's been lots, lots of studies done on this. And I would say this is actually a really big challenge um, because most of the the popular culture um, depictions of evolution are not actually scientific evolution, they're atheistic evolution. And that creates a big problem if you're a religious person, so you kind of react to the atheism there. And, and so I think, um, and I do want to make a distinction here too. Like, I, I'm comfortable with evolution, but I will tell you that is not my purpose to promote evolution here. Like, I don't really care what you think about that, except for if you actually care about the science. I'm happy to share with you the evidence. It's, I find it very interesting. That's my purpose here. I find Jesus way more compelling than evolution. Uh, <laughs> though, I mean, I have no problem with evolution either. So I'm explaining this just as a response to this mm -hmm. question. There is one, um, so in that context of a person who wants to actually kind of get a chance to see what evolution is independent of this baggage of atheism, uh, there's an organization I would point you to. It's called BioLogos. Uh, B-I-O, so it's biology, and then logos, which means word in Greek, or like, you know, so it's kind of like a portmanteau of, uh, of like a Christian and, and biology. It was started by Francis Collins, and I have a blog that's really excellent, and if you send me an email or a Twitter, or like a private tweet, I can send you back several uh, links I think are very helpful. Dennis Venema does a really excellent series that looks at the genetic evidence for common ancestry. And I think what's great about that website, even though you might find things that you disagree with theologically there, which is fine. Um, I mean, you don't have to agree with them. That's not my point. I'm trying to promote them. I'm not trying to promote them. But I think what I really like about them is that um, they're very attentive to be clear that, that, they, um, that they believe that evolution is how God, God created us and that they're not atheists. And they really take out all of that, that, that baggage. So at least you have an opportunity to look at the evidence for yourself. Yeah, I... I agree with that, and I'd say that when I come across people who say they don't believe in evolution, some of them have a religious point of view, but some of them actually don't. A significant fraction of people just cannot get around the fact, say, you mean I'm just another chimpanzee? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't sit well, because they say, look, look, at, look, at, look, look around, just look at everything. You, you, you say this is a, we're just 99.99% identical, it can't be. And so that's where I think that's another aspect of evolution that's worth looking at, because on the one hand, we are, and yet, incredibly, we are not. This, this, this human exceptionalism issue comes up. Well, I'll say that part of why I think you're so important to this dialogue is, so I was having a, con so I had dinner at his house uh, three weeks ago, actually. And we had a lot of this that's, conversation. That's how I got roped into this. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about Wallace's paradox and all this stuff, and I had dinner with um, the next night, actually the next day, with a professor from a seminary. So through AAAS, I'm actually doing some work with, with seminaries trying to integrate science. And I kind of recounted this conversation I had with you to him, mm -hmm. and his jaw was dropping. I was like, oh, this is a pretty normal conversation. Like, mm -hmm. a lot of scientists talk about this behind closed doors. It's like, <laughs> and so this is a seminary professor mm -hmm. who, his image of, um, of scientists is Dawkins. And he's right. like, this guy doesn't sound like anything like Dawkins. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. And he's like, well, can you get him to share this like on stage somewhere? <laughs> Ta-da. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that sort of answered this next question, but I, I just will ask it anyway. Um, so do you find any contradiction between accepting evolution and your Christian faith? I mean, so I think there's opportunity for contradiction and there's opportunity for common ground. I mean, I think the way I see it is that um, I don't fully understand nature. I don't fully understand God. I think there's lots of mystery. I'm not quite so concerned about foreclosing all possibilities of mystery. I would start with that. And I would say a lot of the cases where people make a big case about how there's massive contradictions between the two really come down to a misunderstanding about what our Christian faith is about and a misunderstanding of what the science is actually saying. Mm -hmm. So when you really have taken the time to really study theology and really study um, the Bible, and you've taken the time to really study um, science and understand what's being there, I, I just don't see the salience of those conflicts, personally. 
I mean, I see why people are fighting about it because they think things that are much greater than this are at stake. Um, but I, I, I just, I guess I have a, like a deeper grasp um, personally. I mean, like, I, I just find, I think that I followed Jesus because of the resurrection, not because evolution is wrong. And if that's the case, like, even if evolution is true, that doesn't really change how I see Jesus. And so I'm just not nearly as threatened in this conversation as so many other people are. Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think it's more of a di- become a d- real distraction. Instead of that, instead of that, I'm interested in what is the genetic difference between humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans and all the other creatures that were around at the time, and why did we turn out so different? Mm-hmm. And that's the mystery, I think. And that's the same mystery as talking about, uh, if you want to call it, God's creation of humans or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's the same mystery. Right. Well, I mean, I will say this. I mean, so, I, okay, I want to acknowledge a reality here. Um, there are many Christians in this room. I think some of the Christians here, because this is how I would have been in high school, are completely flipping out. <laughs> They're like, oh, my goodness, the Christian person here <laughs> is okay with evolution. I thought that's what the role of Christianity is, to argue against evolution, right? <laughs> well, not, not my brand of Christianity. <laughs> We've always been okay with evolution. <laughs> No, it's, it's really a, a American uh, fundamentalism. You know, fundamental Protestant thing. But I mean, I, so, I mean, you might say that evolution, I, I don't actually really care what you think about evolution in the end. I, I just think that one thing I'm very certain of is that, the, that like Jesus, like this person, Jesus in history, he is just way more compelling than any of our arguments against evolution. Right. Can anyone agree with me about that? <laughs> No one's raising their hands? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I mean, it's funny. I was in a, a I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I just really think that, that Jesus is just so much more compelling. Even if the argument, so if you're a person who disagrees with evolution here, even if your argument against evolution is correct, I just think that Jesus is more compelling. So that's kind of where my focus is. Um, and, and I would say even... Even my non-Christian colleagues kind of agree with that. It's interesting. I I was surprised when I became a professor how curious people are, how curious scientists are about Jesus. So this is a question for both of you. Do you believe humans are inherently good or inherently evil or both? Both. (laughs) (laughs) We we just gave you all the examples. It left Mother (laughs) Teresa. You could, in fact, you could construct a a thought experiment where Osama bin Laden had an identical twin who was snatched at birth and put that twin through a completely different experience and come out with the most amazing, wonderful person on the planet. So that's the other unique thing about humans, that not unique, but very unusual feature about humans. While our genes really you know, determine our personality and our basic makeup. The end product is so incredibly flexible. And so I, I think that uh, that's uh, a reason why, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, so I think there's an interesting cultural language thing. So I would say it's actually both. I think yeah. that humans have capacity for great good and great evil. And, um, and I don't think that we can really escape our tendency towards evil. And it's interesting because the language, there's like a language thing that happens So um, that I've noticed between Christians and scientists. Scientists generally will say that people are basically good, which really frustrates a lot of Christians because they are really you know, concerned about explaining why people are sinful, right? Um, but one thing that I would say most of my colleagues would agree with is that humans are almost universally corrupted by power. We're very skeptical of human power, which is just another way of saying that people are sinful. <laughs> um, and so I think there is even a recognition that humans have a capacity for good. That's what we mean when we say that they're yeah. basically good. But they also have a capacity for coercion and, and evil, too. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I think it's both. I think it's, it's both extremes, which is what is amazing about our species. We can carry the full spectrum <laughs> of possibilities. Um, okay, so this is a question for you. Josh, it says, can you explain more about what you meant about most religions feeling man-made and what makes Christianity different? Yeah, so, I mean, just a lot, a lot of religions, when you actually look at it, I mean, and I've taken the time to study this a lot. Um, there's definitely people who have studied more. 
you look at them and they really just seem to be products of that time. You can explain them through purely social factors. I think humans, for a, a reason we don't entirely understand, maybe evolution, we have this need to believe in things. As a Christian, we might say there's an eternity in our hearts. We know that we're something greater than what we just are here, and we're, we have this need to believe. But, um, but you just, we also have this tendency to kind of construct a fantasy that's religious that we like. And, um, and if I look at most religions, that's just really what they look like to me. Um, I think maybe um, Christianity you don't agree with, but I, I would say when I was looking and I was uncertain and trying to figure this out, Christianity had the most credible claim that this was actually an act of God that created it rather than an act of man. And so for me, that's what's compelling. It's, it, it's not, I don't agree with a lot of churches. I don't agree with every Christian. I, I think... Christians do bad things often. I mean, I, they've hurt me at times. I get mad at other Christians. But that's actually not the core. The church is not the core of our faith. The core of our faith is actually is actually this, what is claimed to be this act of God in history. Um, and if you look at it, actually, Christianity is not one religion. It's actually hundreds of religions. It's all of these different types of, 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 of people throughout history over the last 2,000 years from different languages and cultures, trying to come to terms with how that first contact with God should reorder how they see the entire world. And I find that very compelling. This is something, that, that thing kind of explains all this diversity we see in the, in the world. And, and it seems, it just, it's, it's the most credible claim to a religion that was created by God and not by man. You know, if I can interject something that's relevant to what you just said and also to the previous question. I described how going to medical school changed my thinking about these matters. If you listen to or read Francis Collins, it is exactly the, the opposite. opposite. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. grew up in a religious family, threw away religion, and didn't like it at all. And he went to the ward and saw these sick people and saw how their faith sustained them. And that, from that, he concluded that there was something there. So you know, again, the same thing. You can have exactly the same human experience. Mm -hmm. and you know, have the exact opposite uh, thinking coming out of it. Okay, so I think this is a question for both of you as well. How does science answer the question of, of consciousness, and when did unconscious matter develop consciousness? <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you read... Uh, 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 before he answers, I want to point out that he's one of the leading thinkers on this issue. Yeah. So we're <laughs> really... It's going to be good. I'm really excited to hear from him here. We should no, I'm actually, what I am is I'm in... I'm not officially a leading thinker on this matter. I'm an amateur thinker, but I have the advantage that I have no vested interest in <laughs> any, 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 any being that. So if you listen to somebody like Derek Denton, he would say that, you know, hunger, thirst, these are all conscious, these are conscious things that come to, you know, even so-called lower creatures, right? All the way to what we call human consciousness. I actually, in the book I wrote, I eliminated the word consciousness because it's so fuzzy. It's, it's all relevant, uh, relative. But I think the barrier, and I was telling you guys about it last night that happened, is that all those other creatures I mentioned are self-aware. They can recognize themselves in a mirror, right? Uh, elephants, uh, crows, chimpanzees, whales, etc. They recognize the mirror. They know who they are. But I not only know who I am, that I'm self-aware, I know that both these individuals are self-aware, I know that all of you are self-aware, you know that I'm self-aware, which is why we can do this. This is called the theory of mind. Theory right? of mind. So this is uniquely human, the full theory of mind. Now the internet is one billion mi minds, right? No other, so that is, to me, is the major transition. And in my argument, the question is, why didn't that happen to all the other creatures? The argument is that when that first happened to the first individuals, it's happening all the time. Then you observe the death of another individual, and you translate that to your own mortality, and that's an evolutionary dead end. So there's only one solution to the problem, which is denial. And that's what we do. We deny uh, mortality all the time. But we don't just deny mortality, we deny anything. Red meat, exercise, climate change, Evolution. We can, we can deny anything we like. So I want to point out a couple of things where I see some concordance. Yeah. Um, 
So you're saying the theory of mind is this recognition that there's someone else, that mortality is real. Right. And I think it also gives you ability and capacity to really truly understand that good and evil in ethics. Absolutely. It gives you a way to even think about language in a different way where it's... Well, and it allows you to th you think about God. You can't think about God unless you can think about another person's mind, mm -hmm. right? I would just say all of these things sound a lot like how Christians talk about something called the image of God. Yeah. Um, which I just find really remarkable, because you're kind of talking about this not from a religious point of view, from a purely evolutionary point of no, view. No, I mean, if you, if you are willing to adjust the biblical time by tenfold, okay, and adjust from um, Adam and Eve, which the Bible itself says there were other people around, and go to five to ten thousand individuals, you have a group of humans different from everybody else, who came out with the knowledge of good and evil and took over the planet. That's what happened. That's the data today. So it's not far off. It's just the fine details. When we get bogged down in these fine details, we mess ourselves up rather than looking at the, at the big picture. So this transition had to occur. And one, just a little minor point, not actually minor but important, is what is optimism? Denial of reality, right? <laughs> what is extreme optimism? This is a true pessimist at heart, you can tell. Extreme <laughs> denial of reality, <laughs> right? I grew up, my grandfather was a friend of Gandhi. I grew up thinking, what was this man thinking? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to take on the British Empire with non-violence? Totally unrealistic. So actually, this, our ability to deny things we shouldn't deny can also allow us to deny things that we need to temporarily deny in order to do greater things, and that's optimism. So um, I think, you know, religion, some, some aspects of religion, have to amount to reality denial in the sense of, like you said, you, you don't have the absolute proof, so you have to accept a certain amount of, denial is a bad word there, it's sort of, you, you accept certain realities as they are, how you think they are. And you know that you, you, you don't have, you can't find the exact, you know, fine scientific molecular evidence for it. So I think it's time for concluding remarks. Wow. I don't know which one of the two of you would like to go first. Um, I, I would just say uh, thank you so much. Uh, for several things. First of all, thanks for doing this on short notice. Uh, thanks for being an excellent um, conversation partner. But I really do appreciate, honestly, on a very personal level, um, I mean, you, in a lot of ways, I've looked up to you over the years. I mean, I met you as like a, a little kid, you know? <laughs> and here I am now, a science professor, too. Thank you, you know, for being just that great, um, that great image of what a great scientist could be that I could hopefully follow a little bit in your step, footsteps, if you'll let me. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I'll thank you for sort of dragging me out here, so to speak. No, not really dragging. No, actually, that's not fair. I, I, I was a little skeptical in the beginning, and I finally agreed. And it's something uh, I've never done in my life. So that, that's, that's something different. I think and, uh, people want to hear from you. It's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's a bad, bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> As a textbook, I have to finish. <laughs> And now we have a reading exchange program. Now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, those of you interested in the origin of humans, go to the Carta website. And there are, you, there are videos that have been downloaded that tens of millions of times from YouTube and iTunes on every aspect of human origins you can think of. And we haven't yet had one on religiosity per se, uh, because uh, it, we haven't been able to put together a real symposium on that. But we've had all anything you can think of from the objective scientific perspective. That, so if you're interested in human origins, and I would say that's, I would say that if if you want to be religious, you should be interested in your origins, right? And if you want to be religious, interested in your origins, well, there's a lot of facts out there you can find. Let's thank both of our speakers tonight.
For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.